thank you dr ramakrishnan for an excellent presentation on the issues integrating the government and business role uh, in the last presentation we got a set of suggestions on the governance and here we have also a set of suggestions for the business and the government as we uh, perhaps observed that a close cooperation between business houses and government is essential for achievement of sustainability perhaps the area of cooperation could be mapped and actions taken to and make sure that this area of cooperation works one area which uh, dr krishnan has uh, brought out is the population population growth and along with this the employment or unemployment issue that needs to be addressed we are if we are really looking for sustainability the human resource must be utilized to its full potential thank you dr uh, ramakrishnan uh, we have few questions already in our hand if others are interested please send the questions in writing we will respond to it the first question has been addressed to the first uh, presenter uh, Ms. Aruni Raja Karyar, can you please uh, okay. go ahead? Yes. Uh, I have two. One is a comment. And thank you, Dr. Dr. K. R. Pillay. Uh, if I may read it, uh, he said, uh, many Indian companies on the list of CSR initiatives is not due to legislation framework, rather due to the traditional corporate wisdom of doing good to the society, feeling of citizenship. Uh, initiatives for sustainability must come from within an unstinting internalized corporate culture rather than as a reaction to pressure groups or mandatory legislative companies. I do agree that it should. Uh, my point was whether legislation may be required to bring the extreme uh, into the fold or perhaps to accelerate the process. Uh, whether we have done enough for the time spent is my question. Uh, there are other countries that have mandated it. India is the first to actually impose a CSR tax, uh, but uh, reporting has been mandated, I believe, in, in Malaysia as well. And there are other countries looking at it as well. Uh, the other question I've got, I'm not sure I understand it. It's, have you carried GRI report on the power sector, particularly the public sector by your company? Uh, I'm not really sure uh, what it is, but uh, as required, uh, as related to energy, uh, first of all, public sector companies, uh, I haven't seen a single public sector company in sustainability up to now. Uh, it would be very good to see them included in that. Uh, if the question refers to power sector companies, there are very few power sector reports out there. Um, but yeah, a talk refinery, it's a refinery, it's not really a power company, so not sure. Um, if, it if it is about energy efficiency, I am worried that with the plummeting of oil prices, that this might cease, you know, the action will decelerate. The challenge will be obviously to stay there, but then of course I understand there has to be a business reason for it. But let's see what happens in the coming years as uh, you know energy becomes cheaper. Next question. Uh, 
question is, uh, yes, please. Yeah, the question that is addressed to me is, uh, it has no name though, under good governance, it is, is it necessary for a director of a group of companies to resign when, it, when if one of the subsidiaries of the group has a relative of the director, right? Well, the simple answer is no, but this is subject to certain limitations. Under our law, uh, especially for independent non-executive directors, there is a rule that has been brought in, a mandatory rule, by the Securities Exchange Commission through its rules. It's 6.4, which deals with criteria for defining independence. And in that it says, an non-executive director shall not be considered independent if he or she, and it goes down, Roman 3, it says, has a close family member who is a director, chief executive officer, and or an equivalent position in the listed company. It doesn't speak of the subsidiaries. But in the listed company, if someone is related, a close family member is set out. And then a close family member, it has to be a director, chief CEO, or, or a similar position. But the close family member has been then defined for the purpose of the clause, shall mean and include the director's spouse, parents, grandparents, children, brothers, sisters, grandchildren, and any person who is financially dependent on such a director, right? So with that limitation, otherwise when you say just a director, that doesn't mean that uh, someone, family member, cannot work in a subsidiary, but if he's an independent non-executive director, and then with this limitation, otherwise, yeah, okay. That's the answer. The question is, can non-compliance to human rights by a country affect the economic development mostly influenced by political considerations of the superpowers? For example, GSP cancellation of Sri Lanka. Now, this has to be addressed uh, from two angles. If I take it purely as a business to business, no? if you are in a business, you have a relationship of customer and uh, supplier. The customer decides what he or she wants. If customer says, these are the human rights issues which we don't tolerate. So in our normal audits, we do this one. We say certain issues are non-negotiable. You know, if the country to which you are exporting has made certain issue as a non-negotiable, yes, they have got a right to say no, that will affect our economic uh, you know, development. But these human rights issues are not very difficult to implement. You know, there are quite a three or four issues which can be easily handled. What we require is some sort of effort, effort from our side. Most of the times in our region, certain things are taken for granted. But if only this, are, this particular issue is addressed, I don't think it is an unsurmountable issue. That is from a business to business angle. Now if you purely see from the political angle, it's very, very difficult to see how each country is going to react to certain issues. It is not a government, it's not a business to business. Some political issues, there are political pressures. We do not know, we cannot predict what is going to happen with the lobbying around. So it's very difficult to react to that or even do something proactively. But one thing which is required is this, most of these human right issues are all, you know, identified by uh, UN Human Rights Commission, what is required is given already. If only we follow them, I don't uh, see this problem arising. If I may, uh, yes, I've got another comment. Thank you. Uh, in India, all Navaratna public sector companies are doing GRI reporting. That's about 10 companies. This includes NTPC, which is a power company. Uh, and that's from Mutu at CII. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to stress the importance of putting reports online in the uh, 
right databases to facilitate research. Uh, because, uh, you, you know, if we are to do research on a regional basis, it needs to be there. If we are to work together as a region, we need to also showcase our achievements and where we are heading. So do please put them on the GRI database, uh, the corporate register database for those of you doing integrated reporting uh, on the IIRC databases. Thank you. Well, thank you, the prepared presenters and distinguished delegates. So the session is over now. We have a formality to comply with. Right, thank you. So now to hand over the token of appreciation, now I invite Dr. Asok Joshi to the, onto the stage. Dr. Abdul Rab. Ms. Aruni Rajakariar. Dr. Harsha Cabral. And Dr. L. Ramakrishnan.